and preach tonight and for you all staying. You know why the preacher doesn't announce the Sunday morning that somebody else is preaching for him that evening. So, anyways, I was, uh, I, I was trying to, uh, to um, occupy my son this, this afternoon while I was studying, and, and I told him that I was going to preach tonight, and he said, instead of the other church guys, I'm not exactly sure how to take that, but maybe that's a little window into the, the average life of the preacher standing before you. Amen. If you would uh, take your Bibles tonight, turn to Genesis chapter number 2. The preacher was bouncing all around my scripture this morning. If you've ever preached a message and you've confronted that, you know how fearful of a time that is. Amen. It's like, oh gosh, i got to pull another one out. Praise God. He's, he's got enough messages out of one verse. We could all stand up here and preach the same thing. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 16, it says this. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, if you would, turn over to chapter 3 and verse number 8. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, and this is the basis of the message tonight, it's where art thou? So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, so much for this word. I thank you for your son. Father, thank you for the spirit of truth. Father, we enjoy it here today, and we can't say that in so many other places, but we can say it here tonight at Temple Baptist Church. The truth is going forth. Just because your truth is preached, just because this word is being read, the truth is going forth, regardless of what is said after this, the word's already spoken. Thank you, Lord, for that. Father, I pray, Lord, that uh, Lord that you allow me to give my heart tonight and you allow them to receive with their heart what you would have to say. Bless your name. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks be unto God for that blood, that precious blood. Amen. Amen. We see a picture of it here in Genesis chapter number 3. Those three little words. I was uh, texting a wounded brother just the other day. I was just out of the blue, just fell on my heart to ask him, where art thou? Uh, because I know that he's not in the place that he wants to be. Amen. It hurts him that he's in that place. It hurts me that he's in that place. But I had to ask him that question because, you know, something's got to turn that light bulb on. And if there's anybody uh, in here tonight, maybe their, their bulb is burnt out or died down or what have you, maybe you just stepped away from the light because it got a little too bright, a little too hot in here. Then I pray that God will turn that on tonight with these three simple words. Three words. More truth than those three words and probably you're going to hear in three years of a neo-evangelical ministry. Amen. In fact, if, if some of those groups, some of those guys were accountable to truth, then they would probably be forced to shut their doors. If, uh, if maybe some truth... Uh, 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 sprung up into the hearts of, of the thousands that they stand and they orate in front of week in and week out, one message a week only, then perhaps uh, they would be required to, uh, uh, to either uh, give truth or to give up. And maybe a small remnant of those refugees would pour into the real churches, the ones that's real, really preaching the truth tonight. Amen. Amen. But I thank God for those words. It says, uh, it says an important thing. It says, it says where, a place. Where is your heart at today? I'm, I'm so thankful that you're here tonight. I'm glad that you made the transition from Sunday morning to Sunday night. Not everybody made it. And few are going to make it from Sunday night over to Wednesday night. And I understand that sometimes I'm not able to make it. But I'll tell you what, you need to be in the house of God. When the house and the truth is provided, you've got to take it in this day and age. You have no other option. There is no other truth out there. You have to get under the word. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I think after, after Labor Day, the, the classes are going to start up there for those kids. And those kids need the truth so bad. 
Oh, would we be able to raise a generation that knows what it is to be filled with the Spirit, that knows what it is to walk with God, Amen. to know what the blood is, to know what, what truth is. And so I, I, I just I pray for you that you, your place would be here. Now, you could be here geographically, right, and still not be here spiritually. Maybe some of you were drug in here tonight. Maybe some of you were drugged up and brought in tonight. I don't know what it takes to get you here. Uh, but whatever it is, I pray that God would be able to speak through that shell Amen. of that, uh, uh, of that uh, 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 disconcern, of that complacency. Whatever it is that God can reach you today, I, I want him to do that. Amen. You know, he said, Jesus himself said in the, in the book of Matthew that this people, they draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. And they honoreth me with their lips. Yeah. But what? Their hearts are far from me. Amen. I want you to be close to him tonight. Not just in, in the midst of brothers and sisters who are being able to get a hold of him, but also that you would be able to get a hold of him. Not my brother, my sister, my father, and my mother that's in need of prayer, but me. Amen. Me over is in the need of prayer. Also, it says, it says, where art? And art says something different. It says of being, of your position, of your place. I'm thankful tonight that because on November 12th, 1990, I was brought from darkness into God's marvelous light. It was a change of my position. It wasn't a change of mind that I started believing things that I had never believed before, but under, because understand this, I believed those things before. I was raised in church for the most part. I listened to the stories. I knew all the, I knew the songs. I knew all of that. I knew you know, what you were and were not supposed to do. But that word art, that, that word of being, that word of who I am and who I no longer am anymore was because of the blood of Jesus Christ being applied to me. Amen. Amen. I, didn't, I didn't change my my doctrine, I didn't change my philosophies, my thoughts in life. I was 14 years old. Chances are I didn't have too many anyways. Amen. But it changed who I was. Amen. Wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then it says, where art thou? He was speaking specifically to Adam and to Eve. He knew where they were. He knew where to find them. He said, where are you? He wanted to speak to you personally. And so I'm not talking to the one next to you tonight, and I'm not talking to the one that you have in the back of your mind that you play around with when, when in dealing with your own self-righteousness and say, you know what, I'm better than that guy. That guy goes to church, and he loves the Lord, and he shouts really loud, and I know some of the stuff he does. So I'm not that bad. But understand tonight that when God speaks to you, He, he wants to speak to you. Look, He knows my downsitting and my uprising. Okay, He knows my thoughts from afar. He knows me all together. He knows what I am. I may be able to fool you all. I may be able to fool those that are closest to me, but He knows what is in the deepest inner recesses of my heart, and it's evil, and it's unrighteous, and it has no part to do with God. That's what He wants to speak to. That's what He wants to get down to. He, he doesn't have any use for your self-righteousness, for your churchy smiles and, and cliches like the preacher was talking about this morning. It means nothing. I want to peel back that onion. I want to speak to the heart, the thing that's desperately wicked, the thing that fools us, the things that fool yourself. Amen. That's what I want to speak to tonight. God said this to Job. I love this. He said, gird up thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. He's going to demand of us something for any time we come into a service. Okay, There's always going to be a question coming back. I know when he was talking to Martha, he said, uh, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? There was a question there. Amen. You know, uh, He went to the, uh, the man by the pool of Siloam, uh, Siloam. Wilt thou be made whole? He talks to Adam and Eve. Where art thou? There are questions. That means that we have a responsibility to react to the Word of God that is presented before us. Yep. Amen. Now some of your all's reaction and response tonight may be like this. I don't want it. 
That's fine. God is not going to force himself. Understand, he, didn't make, he doesn't make demonstrative statements to him. He asks them questions. Because if you're not going to find it out for yourself, he's not going to tell you. I get in those situations. Me, me and Cindy sometimes, she, she, and she hasn't done this in a long time, but she said, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Well, that just means I'm out of luck. <laughs> because generally I should know, but I don't know, okay? It's my fault I don't know. But I ain't ever going to find it out either. No. I love her. She's a good wife. But I want to talk to all of you tonight. Because you're in different places. You're in different situations. We, we had this thing up here with the vacation Bible school. We, we talked to each one of them. From, from the ones that could just barely understand God to the ones that are probably out there disobeying and, and living rebelliously. We talked to all of them because God's got a message for each one of them. God has a message for each one of us tonight. If we'll listen to it. Amen. Turn over to Acts chapter number 24. You're going to jump around a little bit if you want to hang with me. If you don't, then just listen. Acts chapter number 24. Paul speaks to a couple of, couple of people here in these three chapters. I want you to look here in verse number 24. It says, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. Notice this. He was trembling. There was conviction setting in. The truth was going out. Paul was giving the truth. He wasn't giving some, some feel-good-about-yourself lecture. You know, the, the, the ingredient to the gospel is that you're a sinner, <laughs> that you've done wrong. Okay? But look at his response. He said, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. That word convenient season, I looked it up and it means this. To bring to a point of crisis. To bring to a point of crisis. So what he basically he's saying is, is I've got, my cupboards are full right now. I got, I got a lot of scratch in the bank. Okay? I'm set right now. I've got a nice car couple of them out in the garage. Amen. And I've got everything that, that life could ever offer me. I've got power. I've got prestige. I've got fame. I've got, I've got money. I've got women. I've got all these things. What do I need? Amen. Come back to me when things aren't going so well. Amen. And we get caught in this, in this place of, 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 of uh, 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 complacency, if you want to call it that. Maybe, maybe we're we're uh, prospering in life, and, and thanks God for it. I mean, we're, we're, we've been brought up in the greatest country of, of all history. I mean, this is uh, this wonderful nation that's providing us all these uh, possibilities and opportunities. But if we, if we compare that with where uh, we are in the church age, in the Laodicean age, and if we could just, if we could just uh, see past the, the, the glit and the glamour, and we could just look into what is really in the heart of man, we would see it's nothing but sewage. Uh, we are, we are, are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Why, well, we don't need a God today. We are our own God. We don't need a supplier. We don't need a Jehovah Jireh. We can, we can do it all ourselves. We are self-sufficient. It is a farce. And if you are living on that premise, then you are fooling yourselves and you are on the edge of the cliff and you're going to fall off and it's going to really hurt. Amen. Let me tell you, the only thing that is holding us up is the word of His power. And so he says, I'm going to wait for a more convenient season. Wait, come back to me when I'm on my deathbed. Come back to me when I'm breathing my last breath. Let me tell you, I, I, I see this in the eyes. They don't say it this often, but I see this in the eyes of so many young people. They feel like they have so much time in front of them. And I was there at one point. I thought that there was nothing that was going to be able to harm me, that I was bulletproof, that nothing could touch me. But let me tell you, one step out on that freeway or on that highway and it's gone. 
you could probably talk to a number of people in this audience. Preacher, I know that your testimony was you were driving down Clinton Highway or one of those on your motorcycle get flipped up in the air. You don't know what's going to happen when the time comes and for a crisis, you may not be able to call that preacher. He may not be available. You may not even be able to speak at that time. I would not wait for a crisis moment. I would not wait for a convenient season. If God is moving, if you are trembling, get down here and get it settled. Chapter number 26, Paul talking to another one, Amen. King Agrippa. The Bible says, verse number 27, it says, And King Agrippa believest, that thou, uh, believest thou the prophets. Here, here's, here's Paul speaking in the place of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I'm asking you, King, I'm asking you a question. I can't do it for you. I'm asking you this question here. And, 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 and uh, he, he even said, I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest. I didn't like the wording in that. That tells me that maybe he didn't really pick something up that he should have picked up. Uh, listen, uh, if I'm persuading you to do anything tonight, then that, that's just going to be wood, hay, and stubble, right? It's going to be all in vain. I can't persuade you to do anything. I mean, there are very persuasive people. I, I, was, a, I was a salesman for a number of years, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know about selling uh, you know, ketchup popsicles and women in white gloves or anything like that. But let me tell you, uh, you get to, uh, to learn how to uh, use the power of persuasion. And, uh, and leading and getting people to act and go the way that you want them to go. But that's not the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, in fact, you know, I've, I've heard the, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the preaching about how close King Agrippa was. I don't think he was close at all. I think he was so far away from salvation at that point it was almost hopeless for him because it, it was all about man. It was all about feed me. Tell me, what, what can I do? How can I, how can I make this right? I remember uh, uh, over in the, the Gospels where uh, this uh, rich young man comes to Jesus and he says, uh, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Because I've kept all the commandments, right? I've not done this, I've not done this, and I've not done this. Let me stop right here and say this. For those that are that are leaning on the commandments to get you into heaven. Listen, the fall took place before the commandments were given. There was one commandment that was given and that says thou shalt not eat. But if you're hanging on the don't steal, you know, honor your parents, love the Lord thy God. I mean, you know, those are all good things. But understand, death reigned from Adam to Moses. It didn't start at the, deliver, at the giving of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments weren't there to, uh, to be death to you. They were there to show you that you were dead in your sins. They were there to show you that you were a sinner. They were to show you that you were not righteous and that your righteousness is as filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. They're not there to save you. They weren't there to kill you. The death sentence was already in man. It was already wired in before Moses took his trek up to Mount Sinai. So please don't lean on that. The only one that you can lean on is the one that had power over death and hell. The only one that you can lean on was the one that had no sins, yet became sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God in Him. Trust in that one. Trust in the one where uh, God said that He washed our sins in His own yes. blood. blood you got to trust in that blood. Yes, that blood has to be applied. It has to be applied. You have to be put under the blood. Amen. Amen. Oh, all this, all this do-gooding. Listen, I, there, there are a lot of good people that I, I tell you, I think it shames us some of the people outside the church, some of the people that won't even darken the doors of a church and how good they are, and how recluded, and how, you know, and maybe, maybe we're too built up with our standards. Look, I, I've been through that. I, I went all through that. I, I remember when things were changing in the church, and I was standing up. I was going to be the warrior of God, and I was going against it. I was not going to let that happen. And blah, 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 blah. That's all junk. Amen. That's, that's the law killing. You want, to tell, you want to know why the law killeth, why it says the law killeth? It's because people put their faith in the law. 
That's why the law killeth. It's because the Jews were putting their faith, their trust, everything they believed was in that law. And that's why that letter killeth. And that letter is killing even in Baptist churches today where they won't, they'll uh, kick someone out because they don't look right, they don't smell right, or they, they know something about them. Listen, I say, come all you that labor and are heavy laden, come down here on the front pew and we're going to preach to you the grace of God. Amen. How He can cleanse that from you. Turn to Romans 5. Romans 5. And I want you to see it. I could just read it. Romans 5, it says here in verse number 14, it says, Death reigned from Adam to, uh, to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who is the figure of him that was to come. Look in verse number 17. This is the culmination of it. We see the death in it. Here's the life. For if by one man's offense reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that good wording? That's exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. That grace is like what we get when we shouldn't even get it. But God says, not only am I going to give you grace, I'm going to give an abundance of grace. All right? We're going to pour out a blessing that you can't even, you don't even have a storehouse to contain it. Abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. I love it because I know that sin reigned in this mortal body and, the, and over in Romans 6 it says, therefore let not sin therefore reign in this mortal body. He says, I'm going to give you something better than that. I'm going to give you the righteousness of my son and that's what I want you to live by, not by the sin of this world. John 3, 36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath life. Okay? This is, this, is the, this is the point where, you know, like what I was saying, where God went to Job and He, he said, Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to you now and you're going to listen to this and you're going to have to respond back to me. And you don't have to tell me. It doesn't matter. You, you can tell me all the... I, I, don't, I don't get paid per person on the on the, uh, you know, the altar here. They don't pay me at all. But you'll pay if you don't get it settled with God. See how I did that? Amen. Amen. He said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son, what does it say, shall not see life. Right. It means you haven't even experienced it yet. Right. You're walking around, you're doing your daily thing, you know, you got your... You got your routine, you go into work, you know, you go maybe maybe you go out to eat with your friends after out to eat with your friends after work. We all know what it is. It's a it's a chance to go out and socially drink and all right. And so uh, you've got your routine and then you'll be here on Sunday, I hope, you know. And you'll listen to the message and you'll file it away and you'll go back out and I mean you've got your routine. You've got and you've you've been able to figure a way to assimilate them all together. You, you found a way to make it, uh, 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 what's the word? It fits, uh, you, you, can, you can fit your religion and you can fit your life together. And, and you're not contradicting yourself because you've worked your way around. Amen. You figured it out. But God sees through that. He says that, that he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. You're not even alive. Right. And, and, and on top of that, the wrath of God abideth on you. That means that not only are you not really living life, but you've got this thing on your back. Okay? It's just living there. And it's holding on. And it's not going to let go. And it's going to carry it all the way to the grave. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. And, and so, uh, so you live that life if you want to. But God, God's giving you another way. He's saying, look, uh, b before you are two paths, right? Life and death. And God pleads to you to not to choose life. But so many times we say, well, we'll wait for a more convenient season. Yeah. Oh, we'll wait for, for me to be moved a little bit more, you know? Make, make me feel good. Wait till things are, are perfect and then I'm going to come forth. They may never be. Right. Best, best time, the most convenient season that you can have is when conviction is set upon you. There isn't any other convenient season because unless the sun's drawing you, there's no drawing. 
And if He's not drawing you and there's no drawing, then there's no coming. <laughs> and there's no saving. And the wrath of God is still abiding on you. I'm asking you tonight, if you're in here and you're lost, you've, you're having doubts, maybe you're having questions, maybe some of you young people. Um, I, I know the questions. I've gone through uh, four or five kids at this point, four I guess, that have asked, started asking the questions. Because they, they, they're starting to realize the truth inside of them. They, they see that, that they're, not, they're not perfect. They see that there is wrong in them. They're, they're hearing these, uh, you know, these truths about sin and hell and the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And, they're, and, and it's hard for them to understand and so they start to ask questions. Maybe, maybe some of you aren't asking the base questions, but maybe you are starting to doubt inside. You're questioning your... Your position, your art. You know, where art thou? Where are you this morning or this evening? Maybe you're starting to question that inside. Don't let that linger. Because if that goes away, if the Holy Spirit... That's a Holy Spirit working on you, okay? That's not just, a, that's not just a neurons in your mind collecting and going this way or going that way or thought patterns or whatever. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart and your, and your mind starting to, to uh, react to it. Do not let that go away. Amen. Because that is a spiritual conversation God is trying to have with you. Amen. Amen. I know uh, times are tough now and, and, uh, and, and peer pressure and, and, and the school and, and the drugs and all these other things that confront young people. Uh, it's, it's exponentially worse than when I was, I was that age 20, 30 years ago. Good night. But it's still the same God. It's still the same redemption. It's still the same wife through Him. And you can still have it the exact same way. And that's by giving that over to God and saying, I want to be saved. It's that simple. Well, I told you I want to talk to everybody. Turn to Galatians chapter number 5. person I was uh, texting with the other day, he loves the Lord. He's just so far away right now. He's in bad shape. Where are they? He actually texted me back and said, this is where I'm at. <laughs> I don't know if he missed it or not. But the point I was trying to send across is, where's your heart? Where you, where's your walk? Here in Galatians chapter number 5, the Bible says in verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty, liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That word entangled there. Now by the way, he's, he's, he's preaching to believers. Because there's liberty. Right? And where, where the Lord Jesus Christ is, there is liberty. Amen. There's liberty in this house tonight. I've already felt it. I thank God Amen. for it. Amen. There is liberty in the Lord. But these guys have gotten entangled. They've entangled themselves. That word entangled there means to, don't take this the wrong way, to be married to. Okay? God instituted marriage. That doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about here. What this has to do with is to, to marry yourself back to the yoke of bondage. Amen. Now I understand that we were dealing with Judaizers here in the book of Galatians and they were, they were wanting to go back under the law. I understand that. But it applies to us in a different way here tonight. In that uh, we marry ourselves back to our lifestyles. We marry ourselves back to sin that is in a, has a greater grip and a greater bond than our marriage with, uh, uh, to, with our bridegroom. Amen. We, we have a closer tie to the way that we live and the way that we want to live than we have to the Savior. I think uh, in many cases we have a greater tie to our lifestyle and our sin than we do to the one that we're actually married to, to our spouse. And that's why so many houses are breaking up today. 
Because we want to do our thing. We want to live our way. You live your way. We'll talk every once in a while. We're going to have you know a house, couple of kids. We're going to... Look, uh, the institution of marriage were that the two were to become one. But too many times, uh, and, and uh, sometimes it happens early, sometimes it happens late, any time that the Satan can get a foothold into that home, he puts uh, the lifestyle between the two and he separates it. Or he puts sin between the two and he separates it. Amen. And what we have done is we have, uh, we have married ourselves to another. Amen. We've married ourselves to, to uh, our cares, our desires, and not to God's. God's desire would be that we would marry ourselves to our spouses. Amen. In the book of, uh, of Exodus, chapter number uh, 20, uh, 21, I believe it is. Turn with me if you will. I love this portion of Scripture. I've probably preached it here before. The Bible says, If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself, Look at this, and if the servant shall plainly say, and I love that word plainly, no holds barred. If the master shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. This is the one that says, I know that the cares of the world are there. I know that there are fun people at work and there are fun people you know, out in the street doing this and that, you know. And I have responsibilities, and that's not always so fun, right? I, you know, uh, it's you know, you feel like uh, you know I can't go do what I want to do, and all those other things. Let me tell you, first of all, if you're walking with the Lord, there is no greater place to you than to be with your family. Amen. A clear sign that you're not walking with the Lord is you want to separate from them. But he, here he said, he said, first, I will plainly say, I love my master. I love the one that has bought me. I love the one that has purchased me. I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own. I love that one. I love my master. And if you can get that one right, the other ones kind of fall in line. I love my master. I love my wife. Do you love your wives? I, 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 I like it over in, in, the, uh, in the book of Ephesians where it talks about loving your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. And you can see a picture there. I don't have time to turn to it. But you can see a picture there of Him being the, the prophet, the priest, and the king Amen. with your home. Washing of the water. I mean, it's really good stuff if you go over there and you look at that. Because in your home, you are to be, uh, you are to be a type of Christ in your home. Now, if I had, if I had uh, uh, all my family to show of hands, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want that to happen because I'm not always who I need to be. But walking with the Lord, you walking with the Lord, you're walking with your family. I love my, my God. I love my master. I love my wife. I love my kids. I, I love it where it says over in the... Um, in the book of Genesis, and, and God is talking about His servant Moses, and He says, I know Him, and that He will lead His children after Me. That's powerful. That's one of those verses that drives me. That's one of those that inspires me to, when I'm tired, you know, keep going. Uh, when when uh, I feel I'm bound, to keep, to keep pushing forward, because I want God to be pleased with the way that I am as a father. That means a lot to me. My dad wasn't. I had a very poor example. But by the grace of God, I want him to look down at me and says, I know Jeff Yates. And I know that he's going to lead his kids after me. Amen. Amen. I will not let them go free. And then what he does, he, he goes over to the door and he gets, he gets a nail put through his ear as a sign. And I think God is saying that it's one thing to, to be able to say you love someone. I love my master. I love my wife. I love my kids. It's easy to say. Talk, talk is cheap. But it was that mark. It was that change. It was that, it, it was that coming to church with your kids. You know? It's, it's that uh, uh, trying to keep them together, to have them walk the right way. How, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, those are the marks, I feel like, Amen. that speak much greater than words ever do.
Then finally, go over to Daniel chapter number 1. Maybe if I could speak to a young person this, this morning, maybe a young, young one who's a believer, child of God, loves the Lord. Verse number 8, and then, then you can hold, well, just turn to verse number 8. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. There was plenty of food. There's pr- plenty of meat out there. There's plenty of things you can feed on out in the world. All right? But Daniel said, I'm going to turn my back on all of this because I want to please God. Enoch had this, had this, um, uh, he had this to say over in the book of uh, of Hebrews chapter 11 in the the hall of faith, I guess if you want to call it. It says that he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, can you say that tonight? Does your life line up with Enix? Would you have the same testimony? Is your life pleasing God tonight? I'm talking to believers here, okay? If, if, if I lost you when I switched over to believers, we'll, we'll, we'll have an invitation. We'll, if God's working on you, then, then come on up and get it taken care of. But, but you're not going to please God. If, if, if you're not saved, you're not pleasing God. There's no chance, no way He ain't doing it. But just because you are saved doesn't mean that God's up, uh, uh, you know, He's not doing cartwheels over that. He wants to walk with you. He wants you to have a testimony and a life that is pleasing to God. It says over in the book of First or Second Corinthians, it says that we are the we are the testaments of God. Uh, we uh, we're the epistles of God, seen and read of all men. All right, are 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 we lining up with the Bible? Is our epistle lining up with one of Paul's? How are we presenting ourselves to those that won't read any other, any other book of the Bible but what we live? Amen. How is that? Amen. But here in, in the book of Daniel, it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Now, turn over to Daniel chapter 10. I saw this and... This is one of those things that just jumped out at me. Daniel chapter, chapter 10, verse 12, and this is a result of the way that he lived. It says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and look what it says here, to chasten thyself. He said he chastened Himself. That means before it even got to the Father to do the work that we are all partakers of, right? The chasing of the Lord. Said before it even got to Him, Daniel already took care of it. He chastened himself. Uh, I believe Paul said it this way: you know that that if we uh, that we judge ourselves, right? That we judge ourselves. Turn over to, to, the, to the book of Hebrews. I told you that was the last one, but I was lying. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 12. Because there is an end result to this chastening. It says in, in uh, the book, uh, verse number 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art be rebuked of it. Look in verse number 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are, what? They're partakers, okay? Then are you bastards and not sons. That means we're, we're all, if we've been born again, we're all going to fall under the chastening hand of God. Thank God. Amen. Yes. Well, why do you say that? Well, look in verse number 10. It says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be what? Partakers of His holiness. Not later on. Partakers of it now. That means that we are taking part of His holiness while we're here. And God uses the measure of chastening to do that. 
But it's not only that God is whipping us, just like Daniel there. We get to it before God gets to it. We get to it before we even play it out. Right? Over in James chapter number 2, it says, uh, All men are tempted. We are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. But when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. It's, it's a progression. By the time you plant that seed of sin in your heart, that thing's going to germinate, it's going to grow, and it's going to bear fruit. Yep. Write it down. Amen. It may take days, it may take weeks, but it, it's going to sprout. And it's going to be sin. It's going to be against God. But if we can hedge that thing off, when it comes, we see that thing on the road or we hear that thing or our friends are calling us to do this or to do that. They're not probably friends if it's going to lead in sin. But, there, but we're start, we, we receive something from uh, you know, some outside source. At that point in time, we call up to God and we get it taken care of. We beat that thing out of us with the power of God. Amen. That's right, Amen. And however far you fall into that, and, and, and you're in the place where you can, you can chasten yourself. God, I, and I've come before Him, Lord, You know that I've sinned. You know that I've done this. I pray, Heavenly Father, that You would strike this thing from me, that You would get it hidden under the blood, Amen. Amen. that my loved ones don't have to pay for it, Just love that. Amen. That we could be a partaker of His holiness. Because I'll tell you this, you get it under the blood, it's gone. Right. Unfortunately, sometimes He does have to put that Holy Spirit paddle to us. Amen. Every now and then we have to get, you know, follow our kids behind with it. And we have to do what we have to do. Why? Not because we want to inflict pain. Pain is, is the machine. Pain is the driver. The end result is a behavior change. The end result is a difference in perspective. The end, the end result is a difference in their walk. Amen. And that's why God has to apply it. I tell you, if God is applying that tonight, submit to it. Don't go back through it again. Uh, we've, uh, we've got one three-year-old right now and you'll have to lay him across his lap and, and all we're trying to get him to do is just to agree with us. Yes, sir. That's all we're trying to do. That boy, he will fight and fight and fight and he will take on more and more and more. And he'll take it on just, just for, you know, just to just despite us. But there comes a point in time where he's had enough. And when he has enough, you can hear this very, very somber very, very quiet, but very distinct. Yes, sir. <laughs> At that point, the hands come off. You give them a hug. You send them on their way. Yeah. Because they finally changed their mind. They finally said, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. Maybe you're in that place tonight. Let me ask you, where art thou? Is, uh, uh, Brother Silvius, if you would go ahead and come on up and let's get a song or whatever. I want to ask you tonight, where art thou? Amen. Are you one like, uh, like uh, Felix? Are you one like Agrippa? And say, you know, uh, I, know I, I, I know I'm not saved. I, I know. I've got those questions bubbling up. I've got those fears. But I've got so much of my life in front of me. If I ask for a show of hands of all those that know somebody that is under 20 years old, that they knew they had all their life in front of them, and then a day later they didn't, it would probably hands up all across the building. Amen. Don't count on your youth uh, as the promise of a long future. You don't have that. It says over in the 12th uh, chapter of Ecclesiastes, it says uh, that... You should uh, know your God in the days of your youth. Before that, that oldness sets in. We all know what the oldness is. I don't have to explain that. But before that day comes, he said that's when you need to know the Lord. Don't expect that day to happen. So I want to appeal to that one t tonight. If you feel that you're lost, this is the place to go.
I want to appeal to the one that's been saved. You're a believer in Christ. You know all the right things. You show up when you're supposed to show up. You, you do the things that you feel like you're supposed to do. Your lips are saying the right things. Your actions are saying great things. But your heart is far from Him. Let me assure you tonight, He knows you're down-sitting. He knows you're uprising. He knows that you're in the belly of that ship going the opposite direction of where you're supposed to be. Get off the ship. He'll catch you. He'll preserve you. But whatever is holding you back from Him tonight, whatever you're holding back from Him tonight, let it go. Because it really deals with where your position is. Where art thou? Your position with God as a believer has to deal with your walk with Him. And you can't walk with Him if there's something between you and your Savior. Get it out of the way. That's all I've got tonight. I'm going to pray. Let the preacher come up here. If, uh, you know, we don't, we don't count people that move. We just have the confidence that when God's Word is preached, that it's going out to someone. Okay? If God is working on you tonight, don't come up here. Cry out in your seat. We're not about numbers. We're not about results. God's, He'll, he'll deal with the results. We're just being as faithful as we know to be. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank You. For everybody that listened tonight, they were very patient with me. I know I scatter about. But the word of your truth can pierce through all of that. Father, I pray if there's one in here that has never received the pardon of their sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, wherever they're at, on, online, maybe in their living rooms, maybe they're sitting here, they don't want to move from their pews, have them call out to the Lord tonight. They want somebody to, pr to, to pray with them. There's going to be plenty of people here to meet with them and go through the Word with them. But Father, I pray that they not wait for another convenient season. If the Spirit is moving, this is as convenient as it gets. Lord, I pray if there's a child of God, that, Lord, they, they can look back five years ago and they can say, boy, I tell you, I was closer to You than I am now. Father, I pray that if we could ever look back and say we were ever closer to You than we are right now, something's happened. Something's gotten in the way. Because we can, have, we can be rejuvenated by the Spirit of God tonight and take off from where we left off. Father, I pray if there's one in here tonight that is far from You, that they get that thing settled tonight and they start walking with You again. Lord, we love You. Thank You tonight. Thank You for Your Word, for Your Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen.